Yeah, okay, perfect. Uh, so, uh, hi. Uh, my name is Einar Höst. Uh, I am a member of the Andesi uh, Agenda Committee, um, and I want to talk to you about why your AI-generated abstract was re rejected this year. Um, and this is sort of my uh, personal uh, thing, so it's it's not sort of the official NDC Oslo stand stance or something like that. Uh, but yeah, so I want to talk to you about this. Uh, so why was your AI-generated abstract rejected? Um, and this is the easiest talk I've ever done, <laughs> uh, because this is the reason. Uh, this is why uh, it wasn't good enough, right? The abstract wasn't good enough. So it's not because like we hate AI, or AI tools are bad, or anything like that. Uh, but um, it wasn't good enough. So the rest of this talk is sort of long, uh, a long footnote, um, because maybe you have more why, so people go stacked with whys these days. So, um, But this is the real reason. Right? So what does it mean to be good enough? Right? What is good enough? And in the context uh, for NDC Oslo, this is the problem. Good enough is really, really good. It's like excellent quality, right? That's that's sort of the level you have have to reach for because the competition is absolutely brutal. It's like ridiculously brutal, right? This year we got more than two thousand submissions for the conference, uh, seventeen hundred regular uh, submissions, and I, I, there's like hundred plus slots, right? That's what you're competing for. Uh, which yields an acceptance rate of 6.6%, which is very, very low. Um, it means that out of 15 submissions, one is accepted and 14 are rejected. Right? So you have sort of like the odds stacked against you. And in that sort of environment, your job is not to come up with like a syntactically valid abstract, something that sounds plausible, that could potentially be a talk. Right? Your job is to write an abstract that will compete successfully in this environment. So how do, do submissions compete? Well, first of all, it's even worse than that because some don't. Right? We have invited speakers and they don't need to compete, so they get free slots. So some are already taken by invited speakers. Then you have your established speakers which, that have sort of like a name, so people will go to whatever talk they have because they know the speaker. And if there are ratings, those are going to count in one way or the other. Uh, and then there is the abstract. Whereas for the bulk, um, uh, sort of the regular speakers, they're going to compete primarily uh, by the abstract. If there are like links to previous talks you've done, that's good. Um, but mostly it's going to be the abstract. So how do we do evaluation? So we use Sessionize, and then we have sort of like uh, members of the committee uh, choose different topics, and then for each topic there are multiple evaluators, and then there's this sort of combined ranking at the end. And it looks like this. So it's this side-by-side -side comparison by uh, uh, three abstracts at a time, and this process is kind of quick. Right? When you get into it, you spend perhaps less than a minute, maybe like 30 seconds, on one such comparison. And then you do a lot of them. So each uh, talk is actually evaluated against several other talks. Uh, and the goal, again, is, is to uh, arrive at this uh, sort of uh, total ranking. So we read this very quickly, which might, might s s sort of like sound unfair, right? You put a lot of work into it, and then we just skim it, and then say, yeah, this one. Uh, but this is also how the audience reads your abstract, right? When you're sort of deciding at uh, um, in the moment, which talk am I going to go to next? You skim and then you choose that one. So this abstract, this is very important. It functions as an elevator pitch. It's really an elevator pitch for the audience, but first you have to pitch it to the agenda committee. And in that circumstance, you don't want to waste words. Right? You want to be clear and concise. You want to grab the attention of whoever is reading and sort of help them make their decision. And then we have <laughs> generative AI. Uh, this year, we got 500 AI-generated submissions, uh, which was a surprise. Uh, maybe we shouldn't have been surprised, but we were sort of um, taken uh, by surprise, I guess. And it turns out, so how do I know? Well, I ran everything through, through copy leaks, and you might say, well, maybe that has some false positives and false negatives, but at the same time, these abstracts are very, very recognizable. 
And I don't think I got a single surprise out of copy leaks. So suddenly, things were looking like this. Right? And, and even to, to begin with, uh, I didn't know what was going on. Uh, I, was, I was having an emotional, sort of like almost physical reaction because I was getting angry as I was doing the evaluation. And I was wondering why. Well, what is, what is, I was thinking, like, I've, I've done this a couple of times before. Um, what is wrong with these abstracts? Because something was wrong. And it turned out they were written in LinkedInese which is the dialect of English that you use for posts on LinkedIn. Um, there were 21 revolutions. Um, that would uh, be um, talks with, where the title contains the word revolutionize. Right? They were all AI-generated, obviously. There were a lot of phrases like this. Right? In today's whatever, blah, blah, blah. In today's era, in today's fast-paced, blah, blah, blah. Rapidly evolving all these kinds of sort of like stock phrases uh, in the dynamic landscape, in the dynamic realm, whatever that is. So all these words, right? Lots and lots of words. Era. Era is a prolonged, like, uh, a historic time, right? There are no errors. Um, OK. And here's another thing, is that I think there's a problem that the output from these tools look different from uh, depending on whether or not you're the producer or the consumer. And if there is a difference, you should listen to the consumer because they are the ones sort of actually consuming the output. If it looks good to you, be a little bit skeptical. I think we can suffer from what you can call like tool blindness. And there's a thing about Gen AI tools. It, it's impressive that they work at all, right? It's very impressive that you can just enter this prompt, and then you have a well-formed and plausible abstract by any given topic. Right? But impressive doesn't mean good. Right? It doesn't, definitely doesn't mean good enough. And in fact, um, <laughs> these tools are sort of like built to be mediocrity machines, because that's sort of what they can do. They can take sort of the, the average or whatever is out there, and then it can use that and produce whatever, right? And you're what you want to do is to stand out. You don't want to be average. You need to do much better than average. You need to outcompete 1,500 human written abstracts. Right? You can't do that with average. And you can't do that with mediocre. Uh, and uh, another thing is that <laughs> sort of we want your original thoughts. Right? We do not want you to provide a summary of what a computer found online. So we're looking at sort of unique perspectives, right? Not the typical perspective. Um, there's a guy called Matthias Ferreis. He's the organizer of, uh, organizer of DDD Europe. And he says that writing is thinking. And if, if you sort of outsource your thinking to a machine, I'm not interested in hearing what you have to say. And it's important to realize that writing, when you do writing, it's not just about the finished text. It's this iterative process where you write, and then you read back, and then you revise, and then you think. It's a process that is all about discovery. You're trying to figure out actually what you mean. right? And that if the fact that it has some effort and it has some resistance, that's a good thing, because that's where the value add comes from. And the problem with AI-generated text is that they immediately look finished. Right? They're done. Right? So they don't invite this revision process. And it's very tempting to sort of short-circuit it. Like, it generates this thing, looks good to me, I'm going to submit it, right? Now, you might wonder, is it possible, do I think it's possible to write good abstracts with Gen AI tools? And I think, yeah, probably. Right? And, and, and there might have been some, right, where we couldn't even tell because it wasn't all this delve and harness and, uh, and revolutions and embarking on journeys and that stuff because the, you were using it in a more sophisticated way. So maybe that's, that's the case. That could be true. What we've seen, though, are a lot of bad, really bad abstracts. So I think it's, <laughs> it's important also to think about why are we doing this? Are we trying to save work? Because probably not. Right? If you want to produce something that's really good, probably Gen AI tools, they're going to be a tool in your toolbox. Maybe they're going to help you write better abstracts, but it's probably not going to cut down on the amount of work. 
and I just have to know, sort of mention this as well. I think there is there is this sort of pipe dream with these Gen AI tools, which is the best formulation I could come up with is can I do some interesting thing well without needing to have the pesky skills to do the thing well? And the thing then is like going to be writing or, or producing art or making music or something like that. And I don't think it's going to be like that. right? Because you still need to know what good looks like. And how do you build that skill? Well, it's like... It, the fact that you don't, <laughs> if you cannot personally tell the difference between good and bad, that's not proof that there is no difference, right? It's not proof either that other people can't tell the difference between good and bad. All it proves is that you can't tell the difference between good and bad. So I think you still need to put in the work. And if you want to talk at NDC Oslo, and you don't put in the work, your abstract is likely to get rejected. And why? Because it wasn't good enough. Thank you. <laughs>